Thank you very much. That's very kind of you. Welcome, everyone. Um, I realize you've been um, making your way through uh, the complicated world of artif artificial intelligence for about three days now. Um, so we are here, the final lap, to try and help you to the finish line. Um, uh, Your Excellency, this is a, this is a rather uh, fun and easy introduction in that you are plainly the best minister for AI in the world. Uh, and the only one. You are the only minister for AI in the world. Uh, so um, welcome. It is uh, wonderful uh, to have you here. Uh, wh why don't we start with the obvious thing. What's the actual job? Thank you, James. And it's an absolute pleasure being with you all here today um, in this wonderful event. I think if I can plainly put it, all of the previous sessions that we've attended, many of the discussions that are being had, are being had in a theoretical level. What should be done, what will AI do, and what we should do, or what we, what we should react towards it. The challenge is, if you look at it from a government perspective, every single person has a different problem that they're dealing with. And no one's really taking AI seriously. My job is try to overcome the challenges, try to create opportunities for the UAE, and to also create a global momentum towards a unilateral or a multilateral uh, cooperative approach towards AI. Uh, and, uh, and so, uh, f forgive me, let me just pick up on that, because that sounds wonderful, even a little optimistic, but a multilateral approach to AI will surely require you to have counterparts. And if you are the only minister for AI, actually it's very hard, I imagine, to try and develop something that is multilateral. And I don't mean that I in a sort of small nitpicking way. Actually, one of the big concerns people have about, about AI is that governance of it needs to be global and fast. I, I didn't say it's going to be easy. It is going to be tough. Um, what's currently happening is I'm meeting with different ministers, different government uh, officials that hold different mandates. And the challenges in the discussion is that they don't see the big picture. AI is going to cross borders. AI is going to give us a future that's either dystopic or utopic, depending on who you speak to. But everyone agrees that it's not going to stay in one geography and does not know the borders that we currently have. So the discussion on AI should not just be AI on foreign aid or AI on the economy or AI on society, because the impacts are going to trickle down on every single segment of government. And I do sincerely hope that, like the UK, creating an AI office, that's a very wise move, and I think it's a bold move as well. Other countries need to start taking AI seriously. We hear many different officials and many different governments and many different experts talking about AI being the future. If you look at history, throughout history, every single technological innovation that changed the world created government portfolios with it. So when electricity was invented and oil and you know, the things that actually moved our society, ministers of energy were, were appointed. We didn't have that before that. When the internet, when communications were invented, we had ministers of communication as well. Now, we hear everyone talking about the multi-billion dollar impact of AI, but we don't see any government appointments on that space. And I think that is something that needs to happen today. We're already late. Uh, I, 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 and I, I suppose the, the difference is, if you look at government interventions historically when there have been huge step change innovations, so around energy, around transport, is at that stage the power of the state, both in terms of capital and in terms of people, um, and to an extent in terms of the power of the law, was such that they could mandate the railway systems, they could set the terms and pricing of uh, energy supply. When, when you sit in, in the government in the UAE, when you look at the capacity of what the government can do in Dubai to shape the environment for AI, what are the levers that you have to pull? So on that point specifically, people look at governance or government as a force that hinders innovation, that hinders progress. Governments typically tend to come in, put a lot of regulations and either choke a certain industry or stop a certain type of development which should not be the case. We as governments need to be proactive. So we need to sit with the people who are creating the change and see what needs to be done today. The other thing is, when in the UAE, we believe that AI is a tool. It's a tool that will be used for great good and is going to bring a lot of peril as well if we don't act quickly. So how we're dealing with the technologies, we're not looking at AI as a single technology. AI is many technologies under one umbrella. 
self-driving cars are very different to facial recognition softwares being used for surveillance. They're very different to expert systems, right? So what we're trying to do is we're trying to govern or to limit the use case when it's going to create a challenge and also try to push forward the positive uses of AI. AI for diagnosing diseases that improves people's lives. That's something that needs to happen yesterday. You know, why are we late on that front? But when you come and talk about autonomous weapons, no one's doing anything about it. And everyone agrees that it's a bad thing. So our approach to AI is AI is you know, a nice flashy word, but let's look at the use cases. Let's look at the impact and let's govern that. Let's also try to understand it as a government. The biggest challenge that governments have is ignorance of decision makers. You have a minister in the government sitting down, getting a nice proposal from a big company and signing off on it without understanding what that will mean for the society. Economic gain is great, but societal impact is just as important. Uh, and can I just ask a bit about the philosophy of government around AI in your role? Because you are presumably trying to shape a philosophy around those very different use cases. Uh, and when you look at the world, you see, if you like, a Chinese model quite clearly around state control. You see a US model around you know, free markets and free people. You see a European model, if rooted in GDPR, around accountability. When you think about it from where you sit, is it essentially pragmatic, the approach you're taking, or there, is there a philosophy that, that governs all of the government interventions around AI? So each approach that you mentioned has some good elements and has some challenges that will come out because of that approach. And I think no one has gotten it right yet. The reason why there's a lot of debate on which model should we follow is because no one has gotten it right. What we're doing is we're looking at this with an open mind. We're looking at AI and saying, what can we learn from the Chinese? There is something to be learned there. What can we learn from the US? What can we learn from Europe? And how we can take bits and pieces from what's happening there to create the right ecosystem in the UAE. But to do that, we also acknowledge that we need to be agile and flexible. We might not get it right the first time, as I'm sure Maybe Europe might not get the first time, or the US, or even China. So how we approach this issue is our leadership launched something called the Reg Lab. Uh, with the reg Lab. Reg Lab, yes, Regulation Lab. And uh, we're approaching AI and regulation in this space in a very scientific manner, where we would create a policy or a legislation, put it in a very controlled environment for a six-month basis, see the impact. If it's great, it becomes into law and it's decreed. If there are challenges that arise because of it, then we go back to the drawing board and try to launch something else. And the people who are involved in this are not just government officials who have no idea what AI is. It's the academic sector, it's the private sector, it's you know government, all coming together to try to shape the policies that are going to govern this technology in the future. So w one of the questions that people have about government in this area is, as you say, capability. How do you actually, uh, and there's a lot of anxiety around bureaucrats in a way that is flat-footed or retrospective in the way that John Thornhill was just talking about with Diane Coyle, um, intervening in a way that is positively unhelpful. How do you avoid that? So the first challenge that you have is the resistance to change, I think. And then the second is ignorance towards what this means. To overcome that, the appointment of a minister for AI sent a clear message that we're taking this technology seriously. We're not just saying it for the buzz or for the marketing element of it. And then the second, um, there was an initiative that we launched called the AI program, which meant that every single government entity needed to have a leadership position person go through a uh, nearly one year course uh, in the University of Oxford to learn about artificial intelligence, the ethical component of AI, the challenges and the opportunities, and then be informed because when they take decisions, they are the ones to blame. They can't blame ignorance for the decisions that they're going to make. That itself has been a great pillar for us or a stepping stone because every single individual of these uh, graduates becomes a champion for AI deployment, AI development, AI debate within the government entities. And how many, just forgive me, how many people are you talking about that went through this program? So we, we had over 100 um, enrolled in it, 94 graduated uh, last month. And we, the first step we did after they graduated is we told them, for you to actually get the certificate and to be promoted, you need to de deploy an AI solution in your government entity that has positive impact, that needs to be presented to a governing board or a, you know, a judging panel, 
and that will be criticized or scrutinized. So if you look at the work of government, we don't as individuals choose to deal with government. We have to deal with government, but we choose to deal with the private sector. So if government does not deploy cutting edge technologies to improve our lives, we're already failing as a government in the eyes of the citizens. And that's what causes all the riots and the disruptions and the protests that we see in different countries across the world. The second thing is government today spends 80% of its budget on operational expenses and less than 20% on actually investing and in improving the quality of service and to improve things across the lives of people. With AI, increased efficiency and better decision making is going to allow us to become much better as a government. And we have the data. Every single citizen has to deal with the government on multiple facets. So we can't blame uh, you know, not being able to improve on saying there isn't enough data. There is data. That's one thing that we find very important. The final thing I'm going to say is we did an initiative called Think AI, where we said we know that some legacy policies and some legacy uh, problems that we have as a government do not support the AI ecosystem or what the AI em environment needs. So we brought in the private sector. We let them head the discussion. We came in as a government, so we brought the 94 graduates that we have. And we brought the academic sector, and we said, let's do a full review of every single policy, every single law, every single legislation in the UAE, and let's see where we're missing, what things need to be changed, and also come back every six months to see where we are compared to where we aspired to be previously. Now, all of that is driven by value. Why do you use specific social media platforms when you don't really trust the company? So we hear a lot about, I don't want to mention names, but we hear a lot about companies that collect data and then lose trust. But collect data and lose trust. Uh, our trust, yeah. Like right. they, they actually. They, I think we can think of some names. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. They, they, they do things with the data, and, and you know, they lose our trust on them. But we, we look at ourselves, and we still use their platforms daily. It's because the value that is created from the data that we give them is so huge. We don't have alternatives. You can't go on Omar.com to search. You know, you you'll go back to Google because Google is so good at delivering that service. Imagine what government can do with that, and you as an individual have a voice. Government works to serve the people. It does not work to serve profit uh, interests or interests of a sp specific stakeholder. You are the stakeholder. So we need to use these systems to improve the lives of people. We need to, do, to use data to be more informed. And we need to do this today. We're already late. But, but, but can I just ask you, how much is AI going to magnify the public sense of government's inadequacy of government's inability to act effectively, given, you know, you, you've made the example in, in not so many words about the Facebooks and the Googles of the world. And if there's, any, if there's any lesson of the last five years, it's a sense that government really struggles to um, set the terms by which these platforms operate in the public square. AI, given its complexity, given the black box nature of it, given its, I, the, the sense of its own dynamism, its change, surely makes people very concerned that, that even if you have a minister for AI, that they, are, they have very, very limited capabilities in terms of setting the, uh, the requirements, the responsibilities of those artificial intelligences. So I, I disagree with that point because I do believe that government has a lot of power. If you look at what China did, you know, most US platforms can't operate in China. So they were able to create their own platforms and set their own terms. The US, to some extent, does that as well. But the challenge that you have today is no one's having the discussions. I know that everyone's talking about ethics, everyone's talking about super intelligence, but there are certain issues that we are facing today about AI and the impact of AI that are much bigger than these issues in the long term, which are how AI and certain platforms are using their algorithms to make people kill each other in certain countries, like the Rohingya crisis in Myanmar, or how AI and you know, these platforms are influencing politics and influencing certain decisions. These are big issues that need to be addressed today. The, the challenge that we have is governments are looking at AI as an alien technology. And they're looking at these data scientists, these engineers, these AI programmers, as also people who are speaking alien language. So you can see that from, for example, a CEO's meeting with Congress in a specific country, right, that we won't mention. Um, so th the issue is not the technology. It's what the technology does that we need to address. So I think our approach as government shouldn't be, should we go and govern every single piece of code written? We can't do that. And should we go and govern the, the algorithm? No, we shouldn't. We should govern the impact of the algorithm. But, but, but I suppose the question is, you know, you take the interesting example of China, you know, 
if you're a part of a government running the UAE, do you really have at your disposal the lever that revokes the license of one of those big uh, tech um, uh, Silicon Valley platforms. Is that a lever that you'd be willing to pull? And you, and you made the specific example of the uh, Rohingya and, and the spread of you know, malicious and misleading information. What do you think should be done about that? So uh, I do believe that every country, no matter how small or how big, has the power to do something about anything. Like, we, we are appointed not just to take pictures and to smile at the camera and to speak in conferences. It's actually to you know, uh, avert these problems that might come up. The, the biggest challenge that you have is if a small country like the UAE or a small country like Solomon Islands, for example, does something about it, it's great for the population there, but it's not great for the other people that are you know, there globally. And our job is to try to do something that fixes a problem once and for all. Because with AI, the problems actually cross borders because of the internet, because of the way that the world is connected right now. And we need to fix it for everyone, not just for a specific demographic. That's why our approach in the UAE with this is we do not expect to do this alone. We've already signed AI bridges with other countries, seven countries so far, so India, France, Estonia, South Korea, and others, to say to them, look, let's look at the governance of this technology together. Let's try to find a unified approach to this so that even the big companies that you're mentioning actually listen to us. Because we need to fix it not just in the US, we need to fix it for everyone everywhere. Uh, uh, and, uh, and looking, as you say, beyond the US, how much do you worry about data nationalism or tech nationalism, the building of cloud systems that serve these big continental economies or data sets that are controlled by not just the US, it might be India, it might be China. H how much is that something that you worry about that we should think about? So I do worry about that issue, and I think um, one thing we need to keep in mind as well is I personally believe that the data is owned by the person or the citizen or the user because it's his or her data. And what's currently happening is data is owned by the companies, which is not right. Even if I think government owns the data, it's a better condition for us to be in than the private sector owning the data because the private sector focuses mainly on profits. No matter what they say, you know, they exist to make a profit. They exist to pay the show shareholders for their stock prices to go up. And governments exist to serve people. So I'm not going to mention a specific government, but all of us need to serve people. I think either the citizen or government owning data is better than the situation we are currently in. But I also believe that the media currently creates a very toxic environment with regards to portraying what AI is and where AI is. All the you know, articles are talking about the Terminator scenario, they're talking about how AI is being a, the next Cold War between China and the US. And I don't believe that that's necessarily true. You have many hubs of excellence of AI use cases that are much better in the US and in uh, China. Canada, for example, is great with regards to what they're doing with expert systems. Uh, the UK is actually quite advanced in many of the things they're doing. Other countries are very advanced in cybersecurity as well, and AI in cybersecurity. So what I think is going to happen is there's going to be hubs of excellence. And because the AI talent is so in demand, it's not going to be the country, it's going to be the quality of life that drives them to different places. So if you have a good quality of life somewhere, they can afford to live in that place. They, they get six-digit salaries, and everyone wants to fight over the best AI talent. So they can set their terms, and they can live wherever they want to live, because the platform that they're going to create uses a digital infrastructure that today is not limited to a specific area. So a country like the UAE can compete. A country like Singapore can compete with the likes of China and the US. What's going to happen as well, the aggregate number is going to be with the big players. So there's going to be 1,000 companies in the US and 1,000 companies in, in China and probably 50 companies in the UAE. But what matters is not number. It's not quantity. It's quality of these startups. Uh, one big startup like Google being in the UAE means a lot more than 10,000 uh, search engine startups in the, in the US, right? So we need to focus on getting the best talent, giving them the best quality of life, and then creating the ecosystem that makes them create these hyper platforms that cross borders and that can have change happen everywhere. And so just on, on that, as a, as a final point, you know, I think people will take a lot of comfort listening to you 
as a, a as a rebuke, if you like, to digital defeatism, to say, actually, you know what, we can do something about the individual's relationship with data. Uh, the government can do something to ensure, you know, a society is best served by AI. But put aside, for example, for a moment, the question of fairness and an AI that that creates a fairer society. And I'm sure the other half of your job is thinking about a competitive society, a competitive UAE in the world stage. W what advice would you have for London? Uh, we think about this quite a lot at the moment. Um, a future in which a city is competitive in a, in a global race for AI. How do you think about enabling, enabling that clustering to work? You talked about quality of life, but what about education? What about tax? What about uh, you know, direct state investment? How do you think about those things? When you look at the future, I'm not an optimist. I, I would like to set the record straight. I'm not an optimist, and I'm not a pessimist. It's our job as government officials to be realists. There's good and there's bad in everything. So that's the important thing. Now, one final point I'd like to say about the future is the ink has not set. You can definitely change things by taking the right decisions to team. What we need to do as governments is ensure that there is quality of life, but at the same time, that the societal impact is seen just as importantly as the economic impact. If you look at the economics, certain things make a lot of sense from an economic perspective. But if 90% if of the citizens lose their jobs because of that, what will you do with the hundreds of billions that you have that are generated if people are on the streets rioting uh, against the government. So we need to look at AI from a holistic perspective, societal, safety and security, economy, and not look at it for one generation, look at it for future generations as well. Climate change was caused because of urban and industrial development at a specific time period that focused on the gain of specific countries. Today, all of us have to deal with climate change and we need to work together. We can't solve it by just doing it on our own or as one country. AI has the same promise. If we look at it with a long-term view, we can create change today to create a better future. Your Excellency, thank you. Um, I think that, as I say, many people will be impressed and a little relieved to know that there are governments, or at least so far one, that is thinking about this. Um, uh, when I was introduced, uh, it was kindly pointed out that Tortoise, one of the things we're trying to do, is not be a newsroom that covers breaking news, but what's driving it. And you sound like someone who, both in what you're doing and in, and in the ideas you have, is certainly going to be shaping uh, this coming world of AI um, on behalf of all of us in the room and certainly COGX that's uh, been kind enough to, to, to make sure that you can be here to join us today. Uh, thank you very much. Please give Omar Al-Alam a great thank you, round of applause.